reach my home. Calling me and now I find Hello, Ed. Hi, Mark. What, you homesick? <laughs> New York calling you home? No shit. <laughs> Let me, uh, well, let's just we'll leave the music for another minute. <laughs> so maybe we get some other people. Well, Marco implied he was coming. <laughs> Maybe I scared everybody away. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah? I have a feeling I played a role in that, so. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think so. See, here we are. We, we, we have a communication. And let me. I can't touch the world. Let me put my earplugs in. I'm not. Duggins, how you doing? Sam. Yeah. There I we thought go. you weren't coming tonight. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I plan on just kind of listening in. I um, I do listen to all the cafes, so I, I thought I'd uh, just say hello and see what uh, happens yeah. while I'm listening. And I don't know if I can actually participate beyond the first few minutes, but. Oh, well. Here I am. Hello, nice everyone. To see you. Hi. Glad to see you. Seems like everybody wore the, the same plaid shirt but me or something. Oh, <laughs> Mark has something different there. For a few years of my life, there was a bulletin board, and on it it said, Uniform of the Day. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you doing lawn work there, Doug? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, he's this, hiding this in will, the shed. <laughs> this, this is my new bat cave. I've come to love it. <laughs> uh, How's everyone? Well, fine. Yeah, I'm okay. Good. I'm okay if it means deeply suffering. You know the, the pangs of creative birth. Uh, other than that, I'm okay. <laughs> well, isn't that a normal state of affairs for you, uh, Mr. Morelli? I mean... <laughs> well, <clears throat> maybe for all of us, right? <laughs> I mean, aren't we all being birthed by? The cosmos every moment. I, I, I certainly feel like I. <laughs> I don't necessarily feel the deep suffering though of the well, creative that, process. That's part of the communication divide. Are we all suffering, or are we struggling? Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference. Well, I, I may have exaggerated uh, a bit. <laughs> For, for poetic yeah. effect. Uh, <laughs> Which we all do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes for different effects. But <laughs> <laughs> sometimes so? it works, sometimes it doesn't. And yeah, that's right. Like communication. And um, Mark, you brought this topic, you know, you didn't bring it up, really, it came up I, I, through our conversation. Yeah. Uh, it's come up in different guises again and again, I believe, over the course of our multiple cafe sessions, but it particularly came up in the conversation following our talk, which you weren't at, Mark, uh, John was at, um, and Ed and myself, and Doug with Terry Patton last week. And... <clears throat> The question of how do we communicate? Well, are we communicating? Why are we communicating? What are we communicating about? You, Frank, I actually, you, you wrote up a little description of the, the problem, if we want to call it a problem, uh, and some, some questions that we might begin with. Um, but I don't know, are we done checking in? Because um, I want to make sure that we're all comfortable and um, in sync before we dive into, you know, talking about a, a topic and getting serious about it, if that's what we're going to do. I am. I'm good. I'm waiting for, you know, thongs of people to show up. <laughs> Apparently not. So. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a play about that, except uh, <laughs> we may be reenacting it in, in our own way. That's funny. But I'm ready. Well, um, why don't we go into it then? You begin. I begin? Yes. Well, it's a subject uh, communication that has been on my mind for a long time, over, over decades, I guess. Uh, I, I first wrote about it in, uh, and this is self-serving. I, f- I first wrote about it in, in the first novel I wrote, which uh, I published it in 2006. And I revisited it in the second novel. And I revisit it again in the, the book I'm working on now. There's, there's a chapter called Communication. Uh, and in the first novel, there's a chapter called Lying, which I think is the most interesting. I don't know if it's the most interesting, uh, but let's see. Uh, Zachary brought it up, and we kind of just we didn't <coughs> even give it we didn't even give it uh, uh, any time at all. He he. It was a one paragraph or one sentence paragraph. He said, "Is is lying a human right?" And I think, and I asked the question, you know, is it is it just part of human nature? And it goes without saying that people lie. Hmm. Uh, and then there's there's all the psychological mechanisms around that. What is a lie? Is a lie, does a lie have to be intentional or is it something that is is now called uh, confabulation, which goes to storytelling in that we like to tell stories and this goes to memory and we we tend to fill in the blanks uh, because our memory is not perfect and also we tend to shape our story in a favorable light so we come out looking good and the other person you know, whatever. Uh, Anyway, we try and shape the narrative so that it favors us. That's called confabulation. And that's what we remember when we tell the, uh, our memory just works that way. So that's slightly different than lying, which is an intentional deception. Uh, But I think we, we humans engage in all manner of deception when we communicate. And I guess one of, one of the seed questions I had was, was is this new form of communication? Is it, is it helping us or hurting us? By new, you mean media, technology, the internet, and so on. Yeah, this. <clears throat> This, it used to, I mean, this is brand new. Uh, You know, when I first tackled the subject was uh, in the early, at the early turn of the century. And this was still, there was no Facebook, there was no MySpace, there was no social media per se. There was, there was email, but there wasn't this. Uh, and and that sort of I, I all of all of the readings sort of have been about you know kind of what's going on 
Are we actually evolving with our brains consciously? Or is it, you know, just to enhance, are our brains enhanced by technology and, oh my, Katie barred the door? Because <laughs> we have no control over this. It's just a <laughs> runaway train. Back at the turn of the century, Mark. <laughs> and that sounds like ancient history. <laughs> isn't that something? Isn't that something? <laughs> Back at the turn of the century. Okay. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, there was no social media per se. Were you uh, involved in, like, uh, Usenet groups? or There the were online platforms. They were all text-based, not like we have today where we can actually see each other. and, and you know, No. Everything. No. no, the okay. first I got got into it is I, I created and opened a bookstore in, uh, right at the 2001. Uh, and I had a big, huge computer <laughs> on the mm -hmm. desk. And, and so I used the Internet to access information about books. Mm -hmm. And 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 I, that was it. And of course, Amazon. That that's where it started. Was it, it was a bookseller, yeah. an online bookseller, which contributed to my demise. <laughs> but I that was my first real when I when I went back to college. There was Cyclet. There were a bank of computers, and 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 they uh, archived psychological literature, oh. and it was in the library, and that was like the beginning of not having to go to the card catalog and the you know you could go to these computers, cycle it, and look up information pertaining to psychological literature <laughs> and then we history. Had, and yeah every everybody at, <laughs> everybody in school this was the mid 90s had a dot edu email mm. yeah so that was my introduction to email was through the the edu uh, and then I went from that to the, you know, well, everything. But, th but this is a second phase, right? This is another level or a layer of the question because we remember, all of us here, what it was like before that. And you know, arguably, and this is the point of Zach's piece uh, as well, one of the points, <clears throat> the internet and this new media is – um, although it may, it may be transforming how we communicate, it's also expressing what we were already doing or what we were already like, except on this exponential scale and this accelerating scale, you know, that is taking the same kind of dynamics that, um, or maybe different, maybe distorted. I mean, that might be an interesting thing to talk about, but the dynamic dynamics that occur between ourselves as organisms and as human what we might call human subjects, and then and then amplifying them. But to me, I think the I mean the interesting part is the, is or maybe the easier part to get a handle on first. Get a handle on might be too much, but just focus on first would be this question of what are we actually doing when we're communicating, uh, regardless of the type of media. There's something that's happening between us within us. Uh, and there's some expression of need, desire, power, uh, various forces and dynamics that's occurring just in any kind of communication across any media. And <clears throat> I think maybe getting clear on that or maybe defining what we're talking about there or what, what that is or how we understand that would be a good starting point um, for a constructive uh, discussion of, of this question or problem i don't even know what it is exactly when, like how we're defining it is it a problem because that's part of maybe the, the pain point you know in, in this 
in this question, you know, there, there's, I think, a sense of a breakdown in communication of an inherent a breakdown on a social scale, but also on an interpersonal scale and just an inherent difficulty, a, a profound challenge to um, communicating, being understood, understanding, coordinating all the things that communication does. Um, I feel the need for some greater kind of definition or clarity of, of what we're talking about in, in, you know, when we say communication. I can, I, I understand what you're, I think I understand what you're saying, Marco. The, you know, my, one of the refrains that I, that I, I like to bring up is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, I agree that there is a matter of scale and there's a matter of intensity. There's a matter of frequency. There are all those kinds of things play into this. But we're still, this is where I agree with you 100%, but we're still involved with words, a message of some kind comes at me and I have to respond to that in some way. And and understanding how that, that interaction takes place and what it, what it embodies and what it, what it breaks down into can be very helpful because that hasn't changed. That we're still doing that. We we may be doing that's why to me the channel is not as important as what's going on on the channel itself. And to me it's not so much a a problem, it's more of, a, of an issue as we like to say in business. We didn't like to have problems where I worked. So we only had issues. <laughs> no, we, we addressed issues. <laughs> and which is which is silly on the one hand because they were problems. But if you didn't say it was a problem, people were willing to talk about it. Once you said it was a problem, everybody just kind of went into their own little shell and uh, got very defensive about what they were doing. So the issue was, you know, well, how do we get these things across? And and it has, and I think it's been going on from time in memoriam. I like to say that the wonder of communication is not that we can do what we're doing. It's that we understand anything at all. That's the wonder. You know, we, we, this stuff's been coming across for ages. This is what, you know, Mark referred to. Um, that, that whole idea, I think lying's too strong a word, but because we also need to understand, well, what does that mean? You know, uh, for, the, for the greatest part of humanity's history, once we started writing things down, people wrote down history, not because it was an accurate recording of facts. That, that wasn't important. There was always a moral import. There was a didactic element. You wanted to make a point. You, you wanted to maybe help somebody live their life better or, or show why you're such a cool guy or why yours is the better civilization or whatever it is. There were those things. And, and I think that's perfectly legitimate to do as long as we are aware. And this comes back to what you were saying, Marco. As long as we're aware that those are those, these are elements that play into what we're doing. We're just not, this is what I hate about cybernetics and I hate about information technology, is they reduce it to some kind of objective bit stream that flows back and forth. And I, and it's never, ever been that. And I don't see in the, at least not in my lifetime at any rate. So that's for me, the foreseeable future <laughs> um, where that's going to change. We still are sending messages across that other people are going to interpret for any number of reasons. It's it's there is no. That's why I didn't read the article by by Le Guin because I saw it three minutes before I logged on. But the what you had stated down there, uh, you know, in in kind of response was it is always an intersubjectivity. That 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 doesn't go away. I, I don't see where that's ever going to go away. And I don't think I want to be around if it does go away, because I don't feel I don't feel desubjectivized. I don't I don't think I want to feel that way. I also want to be a you know a living, breathing part of of whatever is going on here. And I, and I think this also goes back to the to the rather lengthy exchange that John and I had. It is so easy to misunderstand things. It's just, it's kind of like built into the system. So I'm all, I always sit there and wait, okay, well, somebody's going to say something that they didn't get or I didn't get. And we'll have to sort it out. Well, can I? Uh, yeah, jump in there. One of, one, of the, one of the questions I had way back at the turn of the century <laughs> before electronic communication was in a face-to-face -face 
when you're in the same room sitting across a table or whatever, you can read body language, mm -hmm. all sorts of things that this new technology eliminates. It, I, it, this is closer, like we look mm -hmm. at each other's face, mm -hmm. sort of, but it, this is still below the level of mm -hmm. being in the same uh, locale, proximity, territory, whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, <clears throat> so the misunderstanding part is increased by the fact that we cannot read a person's... It's almost like it's scripted which is so far I don't go back and look at the things that I these these cafes that I participate in because I don't want to become an actor mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. want to I want it to be as real as possible mm. <laughs> we've eliminated that it's a People sit in the same room. They, they, I, I don't have this problem because I live alone, but I can <laughs> imagine people texting each other when they're in their house or even in the same bed. Hmm. It's crazy to me. And I think you're saying that too. That, but we, it's out of our control. But let's get more primordial. <laughs> okay. Yes. What is actually happening in the act of what we call communication? What's going on there? Uh, and let's even take the human out of it, the technology out of it, because we're not the only beings that communicate, right? Uh, animals are communicating, plants are communicating, microbes uh, are communicating. Everything is in quote unquote dialogue with everything else. And so then you bring in human communication, you bring in language, you bring in the particular kinds of human intentions and the particular um, uh, situations that humans find themselves in and then have to negotiate through these communication acts. And I think that there's a, <clears throat> a diff there's, a, there's an ontological question like, <clears throat> that I think sets the stage for like how we would under, understand what communication is. It, Le Guin talks about this in the piece, and I, I apologize for posting it at the name, last minute. Name, what's the name of the piece? I don't, I it's, haven't read it. it it's, 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 yeah, it's on the thread. It's actually um, a, a, a kind of a, a write-up or a, um, you know, a review, or I don't know what to call it, a, descript, a, 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 a translation in a way uh, of Le Guin's essay. Uh, it's from the website brainpickings.org, Maria Popova, who's a wonderful, wonderful uh, writer and, and curator. And um, uh, I read this in her newsletter maybe a couple of years ago, and it stuck with me. And so when the topic of communication came up today, it, it came back to mind, and I went back and reviewed it. And she, it, it's really nice because she gives a couple of drawings. You know, John would love it. There, there's um, the, the first drawing is, is how she says we typically understand communication. And she has a, a, a picture of two boxes, one bo box A, box B, and then there's a tube between those two boxes, which is like, you know, letter number C. And then bits of information go from box A to po box B. It's received there. It's translated or decoded. It's turned into some kind of meaning. And then there's a reply that goes from box B to box A, and the same process happens. But this, the, the underlying understanding is that there are separate entities that are exchanging uh, units of information between them. But they're, they're separate to begin with, and then they come together and communicate. The alternative to that kind of ontology uh, that she proposes is another, another drawing, and it's of two amoebas uh, having sex. Uh, amoebas rep actually replicate mostly um, asexually. They just divide, but sometimes they have sex with each other. And, and when they do in this picture, and this is one, you know, her particular interpretation, they, they kind of fuse. 
for a while. And, and then the bits of genetic information go between them. So there's a prior um, unity, I guess, is what she's trying to say, between them. And then there's actual genetic exchange so that little bits of the entity itself, bits of my own DNA, are um, shared with you and vice versa. And it's a sort of heterogeneous uh, lateral process, um, unlike in heterosexual uh, you know, activity. Um, so, it's a di- so what's the starting point, I guess, is, is the question. And from, you know, if, if, to interpret those images philosophically, you know, I would say that there's a difference between a, an atomistic uh, ontology, which assumes these separate entities that come together and exchange, um, you know, bits of information, versus a, um, an ecological, let's say, ontology that presupposes an intersubjectivity always prior to the act of communication. And that intersubjectivity is constituted by essentially our media. And, and what we would, what, what our media is, now this is going beyond that piece. This is kind of getting into my own theory on this. But what our media is extends from everything from our flesh, our bodies communicating cellularly in, in their gestures, in their body language, to our cognitive um, assets, uh, our words, uh, our symbols, our s- signifiers, etc. And then beyond that, we could go into the cybernetics. And, you know, now we have very specialized languages for, comm- you know, controlling uh, things, for controlling computers or processes, scripts, etc. And, and then those perform this kind of social cybernetic function in terms of, you know, managing our large scale societies. So, what I, what I'm I mean I, I'm not a student of communication in in the theoretical sense. I know um, Ed, you are right. Uh, you you know in in your PhD on on mm. uh, in edu- education right this communication. So I, wrote, I, I wrote about Gates, but I also did did work in educa- a lot of it in education. Um, <laughs> let me let me just ask something as clarification. We know, for example, I have um, two of my my wife's cousins were um, uh, forest masters. They were they were people that were in charge of large areas. Of, or our uncle and a cousin, um, and they they know their they knew their w- woods inside and out. But what we've come to find out in the meantime is that the trees communicate with one another. And I wanted to know, like, well, how does that fit into your your ecological thing? Were they separate entities? That you know, because at some point some sapling grows into a tree does it is it always at the seed level i don't know for sure but at some point and it seems to be through the root networks that they do send communications to one another trees tend to be aware of the health of the other trees within their environments and things like that so that's why i'm coming back to as a matter of a clarification to your ontological front and question mm-hmm. um at, at what point does separate become uh, connected or not, guys? I, th- I think that's that's a fundamental question. I, I do th- think I, I personally believe that there are separate entities on the planet. I believe we live in a world of multiplicity. You know, there's just a lot of individual things, and mm-hmm. and and we can hook up with them in in a wide variety of ways and a wide over a wide range of modi that that, that do that, and. My personal feeling is that, well, once you do connect, you can't deconnect. That's one of the, to me, that's a like, one, you know, it's like scrambling an egg. You know, once it's scrambled, you can't unscramble it anymore. Once you connect, you can really can't unconnect anymore. You've, you've made the contact. You've, you've come together. And at that moment, everything you, in particular because you've contacted something else, changes. And the, the entity that with which you have contact changes, and that doesn't, change and and it goes on like this so we're in to my way of thinking we're always in partial states of connectivity that get activated connected or whatnot at some point in time but there is a some de facto state where i'm not connected to certain things that i may be in the future um because i don't know about it yet so there is a separation that 
that becomes less separate becomes less separate, for lack of a better word, at some point. And I was just wondering how how does that kind of thing fit in with the the amoeba? Because in the amoeba, you actually do have, which is an interesting um, aspect of that particular kind of communication. There is actual real life genetic exchange, mm-hmm. which is which is a, to me like a, a, it's a whole different level of intensity than than what you have other. And they can do the one, and they can do the other. You know, but amoebas do that. Mm-hmm. We have a little more uh, complexity we have to deal with that doesn't belong. Whereby, I don't think the effects are all that different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The end effects aren't all that different. The result of that connectivity that I can't deconnect, it makes a permanent, that's just in my mind right now, it's a permanent connection that you can't undo, which is like a genetic exchange. It's an a- analogous to, let's say, at some point. That's what I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, where do maybe I'm going to yeah, maybe where, freeform the, yeah. translate the question? I mean, something to do with the relationship between individuality and that embeddedness. We could say in okay. in a ecological or sis, system, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that that yeah. seems to be the big. Big, the rub, that seems to be the, the, the big, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the challenge is that um, insofar as we are individuals and insofar as our, you know, our communication is predicated upon um, an experience of ourselves as separate beings, then we have to engage in a, a process of um, making ourselves understood and understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and constantly, uh, like that, that, that doesn't seem to end uh, exactly. But there, there are, but, but it, the, the mat, it does seem to work sometimes, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And oh, yeah. uh, uh, it's facetious when I say it's a wonder <laughs> we communicate at all. That is facetious. It's meant that way because we, we do more often than not, really, to some degree. Right. To some, right. Always so, to some degree. I mean, I, I guess that what I think is interesting about looking at it ecologically is that you could look at processes or the way things work in the natural world, just as beings, as animals, as plants are doing what they do. They're growing, they're reproducing, they're, uh, you know, whatever they do. We're doing what what we do as humans, but we, and so there's different kinds of, com- it's not, there's different kinds of complexity, there's different um, you know, types of events in play, but isn't it, it also part of a larger ecology of something happening? Yeah. And isn't the communication uh, the means by which that thing is happening or those things are happening? So if we can identify or recognize or understand what is happening, what are the dynamics that are at play? in our communication events uh, and in, you know, their, their, their successes, in their struggles, in their, in the suffering that they create, et cetera. Um, would that help to clarify like what is happening in, in, in what we call communication? What, what's happening generally, right? Like just as a theoretical understanding of the problem, what's happening specifically in this context amongst ourselves as participants in these conversations. And then, there's a there's a social cultural phenomenon that's that's occurring, which we're talking about in terms of the media and the, the political questions, and you know the the general I think sense that th- there's been a, a an explosion of of communication and an explosion of problems associated uh, with it, which is creating a lot of tension, a lot of strife. Uh, arguably, is you know set, ha- has us on a path uh, a, dist- a very destructive path potentially. Uh, but also maybe a glorious path. I mean, this was part of Terry's um, Terry's story. Uh, and yeah, I'm 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 still maybe st- myself struggling to to mm-hmm. define what we're really working with here, because uh, I, I think that it is profound, right? And that's why Mark, you really highlighted it. Uh, it. Um, it's yeah. a high value target. 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like yeah. if we could understand communication better, if we could if we could communicate better, actually, that well, would be. If uh, if if I can jump in, I mean, both of you said so much, uh, but and, and I think Marco, you were asking the question at its root: What is communication? Why is it? Why does it happen? And it basically is a way for organisms to reproduce. They communicate. And, and, and Marco, you've been talking about how, how difficult it is to discern meaning and <laughs> I, one of my questions, seed questions, was what what we've done with technology, we humans, in at least the Western, sometimes referred to as the northern sphere, the developed countries, but now that's spreading. It's so fast now. Used to be there was a dance it was it took a it took a while for people to respond to the signals that another being or whatever was sending an animal even back to the forest forests i, I don't know about the communication cuz they turn over in other words, this a a predominantly this species of of trees in a forest will give way to another, and there's mm-hmm. a cycle that goes <coughs> on. And we humans interrupted that. There's there's very few, at least here in the United States, uh, Old, we call them old growth forests mm-hmm. that are, but there are uh, many different subspecies of trees in an old growth forest. And it's in a process of, of turning over. And, and then here in Colorado, the front range was totally logged, clear cut. And what came back was lodgepole pine but crowded so -hmm. that they couldn't even thrive uh and then and then fire comes in and we have these catastrophic events whereas in the natural turning over of forest some trees would live some the healthy ones would survive a a fire and Mm -hmm. the less healthy ones would not Mm -hmm. and maybe there was a some luck, but it was probably physics. We just don't understand it completely. But the forest were were uh, uh, several different subspecies, or if that's a, the correct term, there was there was lodgepole, Douglas fir, some aspen, mm-hmm. some some lodgepole, some mm-hmm. some bristle cone mm-hmm. in a natural forest. In the you know, at nine thousand feet in the Rocky Mountains, mm-hmm. the same with the red, redwoods in, you know, on the on the west coast. Uh, and yeah. you have, when you have an old growth forest, they at least the redwoods grow very very tall, and you don't have a lot. You have a, a tall canopy. You don't have a lot of um, you have more space uh, mm-hmm. on the ground. It doesn't get all crowded like you say, so it's not as prone to, to fire. Right. But but the point you're making has to do with an ecology of life and death, like the, the process of life and isn't death. That, isn't that the, the essence of the life? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I mean, this is really getting to the root of things then. Uh, communication. Well, what does communication have to do with life and death? Who... And and you said this in the beginning about amoebas. I didn't know that they 
were by functional, that they could do it by themselves and sexually, you know, it's and, quite and a talent. Cost. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. I thought they just, you know, replicated, <laughs> separated, you know what I, uh, yeah. that's not my uh, human biology. I, I kind of get, but, but the other stuff, uh, I didn't know they could do it both ways. And and maybe we're go- going towards that yeah. with with technology. In that we're trying to some would prefer to reproduce. Margo and I talked about this with with sperm banks. You pick your uh, females pick you know the characteristics and go. I'll take the I. I don't want any part of that sexual stuff. I'll pick my, you know, I'll pick my sperm and artificially inseminate. And that's sort of like, I don't know, we're going back to amoebas? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we're amoebaizing, uh, Mark. And and, and while while it's an interesting notion, um, I've, I've had my, I've done genetic testing and I've, I've been trying to put together my family tree. I so, have. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you do. I'm, I'm still trying to find all of the culprits that have absconded in the meantime. Believe me, they're hard to find. I, um, I found out, for example, that I'm not actually a Mohud, I'm a Pettigrew and, and, and a things what? like that. A Pettigrew. It's a, the name Pettigrew. It's a, an Irish name. Oh, oh, a name. Yeah. I thought it was like you were. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. So much. No. I know there are people who think I am, but I'm not. I'm just, I'm pretty normal. I'm getting right down to it. The point being that I know that we like to think and, and, and our technologists like to imply that we can pick specific characteristics and say, well, I don't like this and I would like that and I would like the other. But you can't walk down to the sperm bank and get what you want. Right, sexual. You, you have no, and, and, is, and you never have any idea what you're what you're getting. The dice are always newly mixed. Right, that's part of sexual reproduction. That that yeah, and for some reason, over let's let's just make a conservative estimate: fifteen billion years of evolution, we have decided that that's that's a good way for us to move forward. And if that's going to change, I don't think we're going to actually get in there and change it. I think we might make tweaks to the system, but those tweaks will stay or not stay depending on how our evolution decides to deal with them. Well, I think that's something that we're just going to impose. This is, you know, one of my my problems I have with all the technologists who say, oh, you can do this and do that. No, you can you can screw around with shit. But you can't say this is how it's going to turn out because you don't know what happens after you've you've turned it turned it over well we've 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 experimented with animals let's take race race horses for example yeah yeah Yeah. you get a winner yeah the adult slew or something Mm -hmm. and 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 so you breed them thinking that you'll get a winner Mm -hmm. and you increase your odds, but yes. by how much? <laughs> yeah, you increase your odds, but you don't get what you guarantee. And it was exactly that thinking that got Sloterdijk into um, trouble with, with Habermas, for example. Because he thought, above my, well, head, you're above my head. But yeah. They tried that 50 years ago, 70 years ago, and it's not a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah. it And, and it, it almost seems that some of what I've been reading and picking up in the cafe is people are going back to maybe we can produce something better with genetic engineering. And, and, and I think Ed and I agree that sexual reproduction is a crapshoot. Can I respond? Of course. Um, Our latest crap to it. <laughs> uh, I'll try to toss it lightly. But so going off, of, I, 
I avoided technology and the human species potential uh, talk that we had mm -hmm. or discussion, which you guys clarified a bit for me. Um, but what I see us going towards is not, oh, yeah, maybe in the future we'll genetically modify and become sea slugs or some sort of amoeba sexually. Um, but that I see technology moving in the direction of virtual reality, perhaps, in which we can, as we've done throughout the, the centuries, we've imitated the horse. We said, oh, horsepower. Uh, so we made a horse and buggy, and then that turned into engines, cars, and the rapid development we've had now. Um, so, but there's only so much we can develop. We, uh, you, The three of you discussed kind of planetary global space in a certain sense um, a couple conversations ago about well there's not much left to explore in a lot of realms but so we're going inside we're going internal but we can still kind of become animal in a certain sense we can become if we want to be the the amoeba then uh, and it's foreseeable it's achievable to imagine a virtual reality world. We're not actually manipulating our body, but we're manip manipulating our mind to think that, oh, we are actually this being uh, uh, in some but sense. We, we do manipulate our bodies. Yeah, and we do that too. So that, that's kind of a, a side project, I suppose, that I, I'm not, I don't do tattoos. I don't do things like that, but um, I don't wear watches. I, I, I can't stand, my skin is sensitive, but I'm what, not going to manipulate my... Your, what's sticking inside your ear right now? Hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> detachable. <laughs> a watch I would have to wear all day, I, and that's why I prefer a, a phone that has the clock or something like that. I can shove it aside or stick it in my pocket. It's not fully attached to me. We could say that about clothes, I guess, too. Um, but well, I guess... All, the, all those things are ways of communicating. Right. Your clothes, and... your watch, your jewelry, the way you cut your hair... The, the, your facial hair, all of that is a communication. Mm -hmm. And I, I just mowed my front lawn. I mean, that's the, one of the benefits of I didn't have to meet in the actual sp cafe space. I could listen in to every word that you all were saying. I communicated with my neighbors in a certain sense. I didn't want to talk to them because I'm listening intently to what you're saying. Uh, so when I stopped the mower to unload the, the bag of grass clippings, uh, I made sure that I was quick about it so I didn't get interrupted. So that was some form of communication there. I didn't actually make eye contact. I didn't say anything, but it, there was that sense there. And um, Erin Manning is exploring this in her book. Uh, this last chapter that we read, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing tomorrow is on artfulness. Which, and, you, which book? I'm not familiar. Uh, the Minor Gesture. I, it might be a minor piece within in, the academic what, realm. but In what forum on the thing or I, whatever? It, it's in the Reader, Reader's Underground channel. Um, there's a, a few posts on this. It, we've been meeting every couple of weeks, working through. Je Jeffrey Edwards is, is le coordinating, leading this, working through the book, The Minor Gestures, the title by, by Aaron Manning. And we could talk about that book, but the art no, I, But I wanted to get at what Ed was talking about, how trees communicate with each other. Um, Terry Patton discussed the mycelium um, communicating underground and finding the right time to arise. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I had a lot to say about this, but it looks like my son is having issues over there. But <laughs> uh, 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 what I wanted to say he's, is I communicate with trees. Um, he's, he's communicating to you. And, right. And, <laughs> and that's important, but not at this time. Um, that can be taken care of in a minute. I, and or one, <laughs> one thing that I like about the cafes, um, I'm not an actor in any sense. I'm not. And, but I do review the, like Johnny says, it, it's very useful to go back and review. And I feel in the past six months, I've learned to articulate my speech a little bit better. I might not be doing a good job communicating right now, but I hope I am. Uh, but to be able to express myself within the cafe, it's not, I think you mentioned, Mark, that it was not, not a lesser maybe a lesser form of communication, but you said something particular, um, which doesn't matter at the moment, but I, I see this as rather than a lesser form or 
not ideal form of communication. I see it as just another form of communication. Um, I'm free to roam about the country or my, my realm here. I'm free to listen in. I'm free to go without you all feeling offended. Um, but going back to what Ed was saying about communicating with trees, I, I have communicated with trees, I feel. And um, there's this other realm to tap into. I've, I've had a relationship with trees throughout my life. Um, I'm not sitting there hugging trees. I'm not trying to perform some act with a tree, but I can, at times, I can climb a mountain and I can experience, it, it might be visual and it can be solely unconscious. I'm not tapping into some magical realm here, but it's another realm that other people have discussed. But there was a diseased section of trees and I, I felt something. I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not going to be an advocate for, oh, we need to get rid of the woolly adelgid or something like that. But I, I have some sort of dendro sense that resonates with me and I, I can feel the communication in a sense. But so there's all these other realms we're tapping into, whether we know it or not. And well, part of the problem, which kind of goes back with what Ed and Marco were saying, is there's just so much to communicate about. I, I want to say another 20 minutes of stuff here, but I'm going to stop. But there's just too much to take in with our, our feeble little brains to um, actually make sense of it all at, all at once, unless maybe we just don't say anything for a minute. Uh, we, we practice that sometimes by three minutes of silence before we talk. Um, there's all sorts of silence as a form of communication as well. Um, so I didn't mean to interrupt there, but I feel... No, there's, that's, there's a no, lot going on. That's great. And, and you should make a road trip or fly or whatever out here to Colorado. I'm here right now. In Colorado? No. <laughs> I'm, here, I'm th right here with you is what I mean. No, we, <laughs> have in, we have in Colorado and I think a few other places, the oldest living thing on the planet, and that's the bristle bristle cone pine tree it grows at high altitude some of them live to be four or five thousand years old and let me tell you you hug one of those motherfuckers <laughs> <laughs> i did live in washington state so i did when i was younger and uh, maybe that's where part of my sense came from was just the awe yeah. like some people can say well living at the mountains really gives you that sense of um being so small and there's a vastness to the world because you look around and all you see is so much height um if you're on top of a mountain maybe you'll you'll be like um, the man looking down on everybody or something like that but so yeah it does play in a good role there um i'll go check on my son <laughs> um you know when, we, when you propose this this topic of communication i, I realized that I um I just haven't given it thought like directly, uh, and 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 I'm I'm not and that's why I said earlier that you know we didn't do any particular reading uh, either for this cafe so it's not like we're discussing theory we're, we're we just put out a term we put out some questions mm -hmm. uh, and we're assembling uh, you know I, I think our th our thoughts about it at least I I am so. You know, as I've been trying to get a handle on it, like trying to bring it into focus, like what's it, what's it really about? <clears throat> and you said it, Mark, it, when you talked about reproduction, you brought in this the life and death aspect, the way that a forest turns over, the way that there's a kind of grand process ha happening. And some species of trees, it's thousands of years. Um, <clears throat> you cut, cut them all down, the, the process starts anew, but then if you start harvesting it, you, you kind of throw off that, those cycles that would be occurring, and therefore the, the kind of deep time communication, I'm just positing that as a possibility that, that would arise in that kind of, kind of ecology. Now, we're in a different, a different sort of ecology. Our, our media sphere our communication global networks, our global communication networks and internet and the culture around that. And everything that plays into that, it, it, it constitutes a different kind of ecology. It's not separate from 
earth, earth ecology. It's no, big. it's contained within. Well, that's I, I don't know if that that's if it's contained within because it kind of exceeds it too at the same time. It's able to act. That's where you and I differ. Well, okay, then then we that then. We may need to let's let's get to another level uh, of of analysis. I mean, let's not make it nature versus culture, nature versus technology. Like, if insofar as there are, and I'm positing positing this as you know one as one part of the assemblage. Insofar as there are inherent, let's say, universal life cycles that are occurring and that are mediating themselves or en- enacting themselves through these c- through communication through what we call communication and that that's happening through us as well and that that's part of a, a, a universal process of of becoming of being born growing maturing dying etc but also an evolutionary process insofar as forms are transforming over long periods of time and constantly adapting to their environments and so forth, can we understand communication, that concept, in these process-related, ecological, universal, and I don't want to, I'm going to say quasi-universal, like I don't want to make a strong claim about that because it's going to be different, you know, wherever you look. But if there's a process happening, and, and it's happening through us. And we experience that process happening through us as communication, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, sometimes you know, with challenge, sometimes with fluidity. Um, then when something is coming through us, when, when we need to talk about something, uh, when there's a particular topic that arises, like whatever, what, what I guess I'm curious about, is what is actually happening, <laughs> right? Like, if it's not just about me communicating with you or either of us communicating with each other, our internal ideas about, you know, like our particular stories, I know that that's happening too, but what's the kind of underlying process that's happening on the sort of culture, the cultural ecological level? Like, what what is... You know, we could say a tree grows, a, a, and you could witness in some sense its life cycle. I mean, you could reconstruct it. You could tell the story of it, right? Uh, from the acorn to the the mature tree, and then to you know to to its its death. Um, now, what's happening at a cultural level when we're communicating? Is there a life cycle happening? Is something coming into being? growing, dying, what, what are the dynamics on that cultural level is I think maybe, maybe what I'm curious about. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, this, this, I'm just making this up as we go along. Uh, so, but I feel like something is happening, you know, and, and I, when I said at the beginning of this call that I'm suffering some kind of cr- cosmic creative birth tanks, I meant that seriously because I'm, I'm attempting to write a poem and it, it's it, the subject of the poem is um, this kind of ultimate event, this, this ultimate event of uh, our, our human transformation, you could say into whatever it is that we're becoming. And the, the, the poetic, the artistic, the communi- the communicative aspect of what that is, it seems, it seems important to the process. Right and 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 the the ability to um, communicate it seems important to the process itself, and that may not make any sense, but it's kind of what's on my mind. Uh, well, may I, as as far as communication, uh, there there's all these okay human communication. There's all these different types we have. And back when I was writing the first novel, I was living on the Oregon coast and I went to see, uh, David James Duncan. Uh, and we talked about him in our uh, book group. Oh yeah. The misfits. 
And we, the we read, uh, what was the name? Yeah, of the, the Brothers K. Yeah, the, the Brothers, Brothers K. K. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I went to listen to him live in a little, and he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't promoting a book or anything. He, he lives in the Northwest in Oregon. He's only written two or three books. Uh, and he said about poetry and please don't take offense. <clears throat> he said it was degenerated prose <laughs> in that you, you, you cannot, if you cannot articulate in sentence structure and prose form, a thought, a feeling that that's where poetry comes in. And it sounds like you're there. You're trying to express yourself in a, in a poetic form because you can't put it together in sentences, which goes to the land. I mean, all these cafes we've had, and are connected. They're all about communicating. How do we make ourselves heard? For lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, poetry is in, and you saw it uh, when you were over here. I, I wrote a poem about my father dying. I, I can't put it into a coherent, you know, subject, verb, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't even understand that stuff totally. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you write a poem. And, 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 you know, maybe somebody reads it and they get a feeling. Or more. Or hopefully, yeah, hopefully more, a little more. Yeah. We're, we're always hoping for more, but it could be it could be otherwise. I mean, I've re also read poems where I just go, okay, and I'm, I'm not, because I, I don't get it. And I'm going, okay, well, that's me. Other other people will get something or something else. And and, and that's okay, I, I think. Uh, and one, of, one of the things that complicates or is complicating our, and I use that not complexifying, but complicating our discussion is the fact that we as human beings are sitting here talking about communicating. And I don't have any evidence to the contrary, but I don't think trees are reflecting on their communication or that amoeba <laughs> reflect upon what they're doing. And, and that, that really does add a whole layer of otherness to our, our discussion of what we're trying to do. Um, I, I think at a, at, a, at a really most fundamental level, and I mean that in the mo physical, or however you want to describe that, but when, 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 if I go hug a tree, we'll, we'll make it really banal. If I go hug a tree, I've made a connection to the tree, and that connection never goes away. That's, that's how I think about the world, because I've interacted in some way with it. Now, it could be a memory that I bring along with me, and it could be something else, but it can also be, you know, like Doug was saying, you know, he feels very attracted to trees. He, he likes tree-filled landscapes. I, I do, too. I grew up in a tree-filled landscape. I don't feel real. I love to go to the ocean and hear the sound of the waves coming in, but that's not where I want to spend most of my time. Go to Oregon, trees and yeah, Oregon. well, you could. Well, I or I could just be where I am right now because I'm surrounded by forests that are being cut down, so we can put up windmills for uh, <laughs> uh, alternate alternative energy. Um, you know, you, you also have that, but but to, because to me, forests are are very. Mad. I have a whole different take on this. You know, I live in fairy tale country, and so forests around here are very fairy tale filled as well. And I have a three-year-old in the house, and he's very enlivened by that kind of thing. And so, you know, we're going through that phase. But we have, we have an added layer of complexity in this because we reflect on what we're doing. Um, communication takes place all the time. I'm, I'm, real, I'm a real big fan of the, the metaphor that says, you know, well, we're kind of like a radio receiver. And when you tune into the right station, you get stuff. And when you don't, you, don't, you get something else. Because I recently read about... Um, um, a, a study, well, it was a number of studies, but it seems that in Harvard, they taught rats how to run a particular maze in a particular way. They were doing experiments, and these, these rats could run these mazes. 
And, and that was all well and good, and they published their results. And so, as is, I think, an admirable and much underrated part of uh, the scientific endeavor, other people should try to replicate the experiments to see what they come up with. And so they, they decided in Australia to replicate some of these things. They wanted to do these studies, and they found that the rats down there could do it much better, faster. And the only explanation that, yeah, the, yeah exactly, see? That's a, you're looking at it and going, what, what? You see, the only explanation they found, this, uh, I just wanted to throw this into the mix. The only explanation they came up with is the rats learned from the rats in Harvard. I'm going to. Uh, That's that mm -hmm. hundred monkey theory that. No, I, well, you see, I don't think hundred monkeys work. Th this is I what don't this either. is. This is way below the hundred. I'm going to say below at a, at a much subtler level than the hundredth monkey. You know, a hundredth monkey always depends on observation. One monkey has to see the other one doing it, and the hundredth one that sees it goes, "Oh, I get it." See, there's there's that actual physical contact within the same place. So, but they could. Now, there are ways to describe how that happens. If in fact we I'll just pause it one. If we, in fact, Steiner would probably agree with me on this. But if we are, in fact, rats or humans, then we share humanness. It's, it's part of our nature. It's always there. It never goes away. And it may be more widespread than we like to physically think about that in terms that it is. And so that with which we all tap into, things get transmitted. I, I kind of see this as an analogy to the trees communicating in the forest because they, they happen to know about the other trees and they, they, they get together and they, they, can, they, they can, whatever they do, send signals to one another about resource availability. Or, I don't know exactly what they do, but, but, there, but it would be possible then at that level, it's a non-physical level, I understand that that there is a connectedness to begin with. Now, I don't get that connected, connectedness most of the time. My radio dial isn't tuned into that. I think in a lot of cases, John's a very good example of this, he has his dial tuned to a different station. So, so he gets a lot of things that I never even think about or never even thought about. But I think they're very real things, and I think they're very actual things. I think they're very, I think they're verifiable kinds of things because he's tuned in a different way. And I think one of the things that our technology is driving us towards, whether we like it or not, th this is the, my love-hate relationship to the te technology, is by the sheer overdose of stimuli that we get thrown at us medially, we are becoming more sensitive to things that we were not sensitive to before because there was no need for us to be sensitive to them. You know. I personally miss the days when I could write a letter and wait a week or more for an answer. I miss those days. You know, I would love to have that again, but it ain't going to happen. Give me your address. I'll write a <laughs> <laughs> letter. Yeah. I loved writing letters. I, I used to live in a castle up on a hill here in Germany, and I wrote letters to my friend in Australia. It took forever for us to discuss something. Yeah. But – they were good discussion. I remember them, and, and I cherished them to this day. But didn't they, wasn't it also in the process of writing a letter, you thought about yeah. the words you were putting on the paper yes. rather than just yes. impulse? Precisely. Fuck and you. Yeah, and, and, and it was within a limited space. You had those really onion skin blue paper things that you could fold up because other than that, it cost you a fortune to send it, it some communication. It took a, a real commitment right. to it communicate. Was, and it was also, I have to add this, it was a very poetic effort because you no word could be wasted. It was really an act of distilling the essence of whatever it is that you were saying into the words that you put onto the pa onto the paper. Yes, I thought I found that a very useful exercise. Well, I I, I, and I missed and that. One of my seed questions is: Is that going away, and is that a good thing? That that's I, going away. 
I tried to bring back letter you, writing with some of my friends. Swan. Yeah, let, let, let Doug get in there. Sorry about that. I, I tried to bring letter writing with my friends and family uh, just last year as another means of communication, just trying to break out of my shell, explain how I felt towards them, actually have an anti-Facebook type of conversation. And it's it's very tough in our world. It's it's tough in this, as you're saying, it in this accelerated world. Um, almost, I, I started it with my mom, my dad, my brother, three of my friends, uh, four other kind of acquaintance uh, people that I had just gotten to know and wanted to explore that, that realm. And it stopped. <laughs> There's no more letter writing. A lot of it is because uh, I found this site and I've been devoting my time to write, type. It, like I said, it takes me two or three hours just to come up with a, a decent conversation here uh, or a piece that I put down on paper. That's why I've, I've kind of stopped at that too. Um, but it, it, it is going away. And at times you can reflect on it and say, oh, that's a bad thing. Kind of the trees are disappearing because you're putting in windmills. But at the same time, where do you balance the, the natural resources there? A couple uh, thoughts so. just leaped into my head. One, you have power lines behind you. Where I live, there are no power lines. They're all underground. And where I, where I live too. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. All of, this no, there this are no tree right here is uh, only half a tree. At least its canopy is half a canopy because the power lines are interfering there. <laughs> uh, and the other, other, the main and the other thing I forgot. The other thing I forgot. No. Well, you know, Ke uh, Kevin Kelly. Um, uh, what what technology wants? Uh, Wired magazine. Um, mm -hmm. He uh, argues that these things don't go away, but that they are preserved and carried forward in subcultures, which is why you know to this day you have people that still listen to LPs. It's not how most people buy their music or consume their music, but there's a dedicated group that the people that still ride horses. Um, and, you know, even, you know, very religious subcultures that um, use them, not just for recreation <clears throat> or out of love for the animal, but uh, as their means of, of transportation, because they, they've rejected the, you know, the progress or the you know, technological uh, evolution. Um, so, so what, but, but then they become something else. They become kind of a market in that sense, like the, a niche, right? Uh, <laughs> this is part of, this is also Sloterdijk's argument about literature. It's, it's not driving culture anymore uh, in the way that perhaps at one time, it, or certainly at one time it did when that was the way that you communicated. You took the time to write something down on paper, the paper had to be reproduced in some way that, you know, the, the, and then uh, disseminated uh, in a very, in a relatively slow way, a lot faster than, than previously, of course, but now really slow compared to how we could do it through, through digital means. People still read books. People still like physical books compared to, to digital books. Um, and so Kelly's argument would be that of course, that's going to continue, but it just sort of falls behind the leading edge. I don't think he uses this language. This would be more uh, Wilberian language, the leading edge of, of evolution. And too bad, you know, <laughs> like it, it, if you, you know, it's, an, it's our choice to continue trying to write letters and maybe a few people, you know, would, would, will continue to do that. Um, and it's unfortunate that the value, the particular, the peculiar value that comes with that kind of slower form of thought and these slower forms of communication is, um, is lost. But I, I feel somewhat optimistic about it because um, I think that you get, I think one gets tired of the constant stimulation. One gets tired of the, the accelerated mode. I, I think that it, and Jeffrey has made this point as well, that ultimately it will play itself out because it's just too exhausting. It just isn't, it isn't fun after it a while. Is, it's, is that the evolutionary 
part of it in that those who can move faster are going to survive. And those of us like Ed and myself and a few others who we can't keep up and we're going to extinct. And the only reproduction is going to be with those people who can twiddle their, th they don't think the way we do anymore. Mm -hmm. That's part of what y'all are getting to with the evolution of consciousness is that it's at a level that Ed and I are dinosaurs and we're simply not going to reproduce because nobody will mate with us. <laughs> <laughs> are you okay with him speaking for you on this, Ed? I don't <laughs> Uh, he have... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, are we being left behind by, you know, let alone the AI, just the, the programmers, you know, the, um, the technologists, uh, are, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the global capitalists, I mean, those who really are dedicated to speed, to, to even more speed. It's not fast mm -hmm. enough. Um, because, you know, Sloterdijk also puts, puts out, it's about now the circumambulation of P Peter Sloterdijk, the German Is he the spear bubble Yeah, he's the spear guy. There and there and, yes, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's about how fast capital can move. And so communication has to occur at the speed of capital, uh, is his argument. And, and he wrote an essay, by the way, called Rules for the Human Zoo, which is where um, he makes this point about uh, you know, culture becoming more of an archiving function rather than a kind of you know, evolutionary function. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, we're the, we're the kind of oddities, you know, in, in, in the human zoo, we have our, our, our little safe area where we can't hurt anybody. Uh, and here we can do our poetry and, you know, folk music or whatever it is. It's kind of cynical, I think, you know, <laughs> an outlook on things, but just to be intellectually honest, I have to ask, is that true? And, and I'd, I'd like to pick up on the comment that Jeffrey made. He said it'll play itself out. And I, I think there's a certain aspect of that that may be true, but we are also, we also have the potential to not play it out, but wipe ourselves out. You know, we, we can play the, the capital game at the speed of capital, whatever, how you ever want to describe that. But in 2008, we had a, we had a preview of where that leads. And, and there are a number of economists who are telling us, well, it's going to happen again, and it's going to happen a lot sooner than a lot of people would like us to think. And that's going to be a poorly funded, orchestrated dress rehearsal for what's about to come. You know, we, we do have, for whatever reasons, and in, in a number of domains, um, uh, you know, all, of, all of the military posturing that's going on um, at this time in the world, you know, they have that, that has very real possible consequences to it. You know, only one, you only have to drop one nuclear, you never drop one, one droop, not in this day and age, one nuclear device will not be de detonated, period. There will be at least two. And those two will have effects and, 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 and follow on effects. Um, and follow on to those effects that, that most of us don't even want to think about. So it okay. can happen financially, and it can happen physically, and it can happen in a lot of a lot of different domains. Because we are, in some regard, I'm not I'm not speaking of this in nihilistic terms, but we are constantly on the brink of the precipices, and and we can push ourselves over. We humans can do that. That's that's possible. That's why I think it's important that we reflect on these things and we talk about that. And some of us. I don't think it's a niche market that some of us say, well, let's slow down a little bit and think about it a little more intensely because too many people don't think about it at all. 
one of the consequences that we do have with the thumb communication generation is there is no, there is nothing other than superficial thinking going on for the most part. It's always well, knee-jerk reaction. It's not thought out. There's no consequences to my thoughts, actions, or words. And and they, those can have, they can, they don't have to, but they can have devastating consequences. Personally, at, at that level. Socially, at that level. Politically, nationally, at that level. Or <clears throat> planetary, at that level. It's all possible. And then we, and we just stop. I mean, okay, we, we didn't figure it out in time. We're gone. But Mark and I don't have to worry about that because, we, you know, we're pretty close to wherever it is that we're going anyway. But... And, and, and that's not a bothersome thing. That's just, that those are, that's just, you know, one of the facts of life. I don't consider myself a dinosaur. I just consider too old to be mating. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, let, Been there. Done let, that. Me, <laughs> let, me, let me jump in quickly. And, and I think that I excuse myself from the uh, Terry Patton uh, cafe because I, I didn't, Accept his premise, which Ed was just that we're going, we have the potentiality to destroy human, the human species. I don't think that's accurate. Hmm. I, and I go way back to Stephen King, who I'm not a big fan of Stephen King, but he re wrote some good books. And, and way back when he wrote The Stand, which was mm -hmm. a, a biological a, a pathogen started to destroy the human race. But some people survived. Yeah. And I think no matter what happens, albeit with the exception of an asteroid hitting the Earth or, or the Earth's, I don't know, spinning out of con something like that, there will be human beings who survive no matter what. And then they'll, and then we'll start all over again. Say, can I have some of your purple berries? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the doomsday scenarios. Yeah, Ed, you and I, we can see mm -hmm. the end. But for the human race, no. We're well, going to go on. Just, just as the counter argument, okay. Um, you said except, except for the for the you know um, the cosmic event, you know, some meteorite hits the Earth or whatever it is. But we're sitting on the capability to equal that. That that's my. I'm not. I agree with you fundamentally. I'm sure that somebody's going to be left over, just like after the flood. You know, Noah and his kind were left over. The story's there. I, you know, I would not deny it. And, and it could be, and it could be that, you know, like when the dinosaurs went because of the cosmic cataclysmic event, as, as some postulate, there were still mammals. There were still niche organisms that, that took over and went on. I don't, I don't argue any of that. But for all intents and purposes, humanity as we know it would be gone. Because it is going to start over again, and we we have that potential. That's all that I'm saying. I'm not saying we're going to use the potential. I certainly hope we don't. I would like to think that some reason would would countervail, and we'd start saying, "Well, this is actually a stupid thing to be doing to begin with," and maybe we should just dismantle all of this stuff. I don't see it happening in the, in in the well, midterm, and it won't. No, so because we are not we are not who we think we are. We're not rational. <laughs> well, it all depends on what you mean by rational. Okay. <laughs> well, you're speaking right. Uh, hey. But yeah, in the general, all of them, in the generally understood and accepted meaning of the word, I agree with you 100%. If we take this to the rational to the national level, um, mm -hmm. like we're even as govern, we don't know how to have a global governance. Like that's not going doesn't seem like that'll happen anytime soon. There's certain groups that'll form up for uh, the IMF or what NATO or something like that. But to actually have all of us working together um, as nations, 
um, not necessarily to bond to make the world one, but to solve, like we, we have, as we've noted, the ecological problem, the, the environment could collapse at any moment. Um, and, and there's human stupidity that, that we decide to launch a bomb, then we've, the, yeah, it's the end of the world as we know it. And we, we as humans are just unable to, like, can we, can we even reach that next, not that global government, would be the solution, but maybe that's where we're going with planetary understanding of communication. We're not communicating with one another. It, it's uh, it's economic. It's mostly financial. Uh, if we're communicating, it, it's to our benefit or my benefit as a country to make a deal, um, which is good and it's very useful. But no, I don't see any country, even the the best of like some people might say Sweden's the most enlightened or something like that but they're they've got their own they're they're selfish in their own way they're they're focused on themselves um but no one is focusing to the full extent that they can and in, in the political realm to to that which is the planetary solution i suppose does that make sense yes but so let's go back to terry Patton and his book which we discussed la last week, and um, I, uh, I think I understand your 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 objection uh, to his his premise, um, Mark. So we, we don't need to, you know, revisit that question exactly. Um, although he writes about it, and his view is maybe not as black and white, uh, you know, as as uh, I think you might be describing it. Um, he, he, he's, he, I think is, leaves open the possibility of multiple outcomes, uh, from the convergence, the acceleration, what is happening, uh, on the earth amongst humans and, you know, also ecologically, uh, especially at this time, but the, on the question of communication, because if the premise is a different premise that we're not commun we're not thinking. We're not communicating about what actually matters about the, the bigger, most significant <clears throat> questions that you know ha could have relevance to the human experiment as such. We could say that Terry's book, for whatever you think of it, however you evaluate it, is an attempt at communication. And he's trying to point to something. He's trying to say something about something that many people, most people are, are not paying attention to. And I think that that's interesting that just the fact that he would do that. Now, a lot of, you know, authors, you know, who feel like they have particular insight into something about the world. That's, that's, I, I would argue part of what's motivating them is the need to communicate the need to show others what they see. Uh, even if they may not even totally be clear, like Terry doesn't have a crystal ball. He's not seeing the future, but he's, seeing a set of possibilities he's seeing a set of scenarios and he's trying to think through uh how we might um how we might steer things to the degree that we quote unquote we could toward more preferable outcomes let's say not the cataclysmic not the uh you know global ecological collapse world war three however whatever kind of doomsday scenario you, you want you want to paint um, and, and so what are the, my, I guess, like what, if I have a question there, it's what, um, how, what are the, uh, uh, the hopes, you know, and what are the prospects for that kind of communication? And we're insofar, if we even believe that, that, that that's worth doing, that that could have an effect. And uh, Terry's argument is that it could. He's, that we, his argument is that we all have an effect. We don't know what it is, can't calculate it, but we have one. Uh, or at least we could, we have to postulate that we do. Um, but if there is a need for some kind of communication about some existential level situation that we collectively face because he's talking about all human beings, the planetary planetary scale. How, how would we do that? 
how would we do that better? How would we do that more effectively? Do we even, are we doing that? Do we care to do that? Uh, this is some, these are some things that were coming out too in the discussion with, with John on, on the topic in, in the forum is around, uh, you know, what, what our orientation even is to that crisis. Uh, what crisis are we talking about? John had a different interpretation of what that crisis meant. He's experienced it through his own, um, you know, through his own life, uh, talked about being in uh, you know, the, the AIDS uh, crisis as being an event on the level of devastation that Terry's kind of talking about in this global planetary context. So I, I think that, you know, when, when we ask what, commu- what is at stake in communication, and I come back to this matter of life and death, and what we're really trying to save or what we're trying to perpetuate, what we're trying to grow. Um, this is maybe what we're, the, the level at which we need to be looking at it is that it, it, it may be a matter of life and death. It is, I'd say, a matter of life and death for on, on the species level, but even for individuals, the ability to communicate may be a matter of life and death. <clears throat> uh, and we talked about suicide. Um, the, a person comes to mind who I didn't know super well, but who committed suicide. And what do I think I know, was... Do I know them? No. Okay. Uh, but there's, an, there's another person we have in common. Yes. Uh, an author who we yes. could talk about, uh, who thought a lot about communication, uh, David Foster yeah, Wallace, Wallace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but this person I'm thinking about when I think about what really maybe drove their decision to take their own life and the despair behind it, it was precisely the inability to communicate, the inability to have a sympathetic rapport with another being. And the, uh, you know, to me, that's where the question of art, the question of poetry has to has to come from because if to me the, the most valuable poetry is is that which in some way bridges that chasm uh and, and so and that's that's all what makes it so difficult of course well if if i may jump in I, it was a very brief comment that john davis said it must spend two cafes ago that the the most significant thing and this wasn't an original thought of his for a human being is to find one person one person who believes in you who your a cliche mm-hmm. have their back and if you can find that that that's like the world mm-hmm. that's like the rainbow the, and that's almost non-existent it's a it's it's a fair it's a fairy tale it's you know the silver slipper, the beauty and the beast, whatever. And, 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 but that remains a constant in the human condition. If you can find one person, you will not uh, you will want to continue mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. carry on. And this, this is getting real heavy <laughs> but uh, you know it's all tied into communication and and how people interact with each other and the world and, and and all that it's all about you know who am i what am i do i matter mm-hmm. significance and philosophy, all that shit that nobody, yeah, uh, 
Terry spoke about people putting their, we're in a trance, put their heads in the sand. Yeah, not really. Everybody sort of has these same impulses. They just want to be somebody. Mm-hmm. The matter. Mm-hmm. I think part of maybe, I, I, I don't know why evolution came to mind, but part of maybe our realiz- realization is the fact that we will, if you can realize that you will never have that connection with anyone, no matter how hard you search, no matter how long you may think you have it. Like if drugs, we can, drugs, LSD. <laughs> that, that's a fleeting thing there. But if we, if we acknowledge, and this can be on individual with another individual or on the larger scales, like if we just simply acknowledge that fact that we will never have that um, connection, the full connection at least, but, but at the same time that we, we have each other's backs. Like we could make a pack right now to um, be the dynamic four, to take care of each other, to always be there, to no matter what, we're going to do the best we can, but that's, we know that's impossible. No matter how close we get, no matter how close we get to understanding our each individual, um, it's not going to happen. Isn't that, the, <laughs> isn't that the essence of gangs, blood brothers, and all that? Well, just a different word, um, solidarity. That, that's, mm-hmm. the, that's the word that Sloterdijk uses. Of course, that comes out of a you know, tradition more, I'd say, more Marxist, um, revolutionary kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, groupings. But just just as a as a as a word that might be useful, mm-hmm. Gr- groups have solid people, individual g- small groups have solidarity with each other. Co- larger cultural groups, tribal groups have solidarity. There, there's there's that group dynamic, right? That is part of the inherent nature, I think, of communication. We have to share something in common in order for us to be able to use the same signifiers and have them mean something similar to one another. And that commonness first arises in a group setting, a group, you know, space. But then it's also part of the problem because you have competing groups, right? And then these competing groups ally with each other. It's obviously very complicated to the point where now we have nation states with nuclear bombs. Uh, that can destroy each other and, and the whole you know, human sphere. So, I mean, what, what seems to be one of the difficulties in this moment is that it's difficult to find solidarity. Uh, it's difficult to find, um, not that, you know, you need a group because there's something, I think, in the sort of postmodern Mod, you know the contemporary world where um, I don't know that there's maybe some some maybe this is ideological but a push you know to go beyond the group a push to identify with something bigger than the small group and that's part of Terry's message as well so we have to transcend our limited identifications and find bigger identifications right we want to identify with the whole planet we want to identify with Gaia. That's the, that's the idea. But there are limits to that, which I think, Mark, is something you repeatedly um, uh, you know, bring to our attention. And those are the, the human species biological limits where we have evolved in small groups. We communicate best in small groups. And that really gets disrupted by the universalizing kind of move that comes with modern technology and globalization and so forth. So how do you have both? If we, because we need the global perspective because we share a common earth and we're engaging in activities that have global effects. You build a nuclear power plant, everybody's got to be concerned about it. It can't just be a local, local concern. Um, same with climate change, etc. At the same time, we don't actually derive, it seems most of us, vast majority of us don't derive 
a sense of belonging and solidarity to that larger whole. And I don't even know how we could. Uh, and and that, that's where I see maybe, I mean, if we had Terry here, I'd, I'd be curious to ask what he thinks about that, because I think that's part of the real crux of the issue that we're facing is this disjuncture between our local, intimate, smaller group, subcultural, underground kind of context, and then this big global planetary cosmic context. Like they have to somehow sync up with each other and, and, and they're not doing that very well, I think. Yes, but part, part, part of it, let me take this down just a, a notch. Because I think just like I, I can talk about doomsday scenarios and that's just, it's too much for most people. And it's, and as Mark pointed out, it's actually unnecessary, which is a, is a good point. Gabe said that the whole purpose of human existence is purpose, the wrong word, but he says it's about transcendence. It's about thinking that there's just more than me. It's that, it, that simple. There's got to be, there's more than just me. We're, we're, in our current day and age, as we are in, in American and European uh, circles, constantly embarked by it's you and just you. It's you and just you. And if you're a, a materialist at heart, consciously or unconsciously, then that's all there can be. And, it's, and that's a very problematic place to be as far as I'm concerned, because I believe that there's, there, there's more than just me. And if I can find one human being, for whatever reason, anywhere, like I said earlier, once you connect, you can never disconnect. If you find one other human being that you connect with, you know in that moment, you have experienced it in the deepest part of your own being, that there's more than just me. And if you don't get that, and I believe that there are human beings that don't ever get that, and they all, they, some of them opt to just I'm going to end this now because I'm not going to look any further. I don't fault anyone for not wanting to look at it. You can just get tired of looking. But it's very difficult in many regards to do that these days. But the opportunities to do that have increased because you can do it with people that you never would have ever met before. Way back in the day. This is way before. This is, this is early in the previous century. <laughs> I used to be I used to be on on, on Usenet groups called text space flame war whatever uh, online really no visual interaction no video just typing ASCII characters at eighty characters per screen if you, you could even make your screen that big that <laughs> did you have to HTTP no no have... none of that this was before that. <laughs> oh, even before this that? Is, yeah, this is yeah, this is back. The only thing difference between us and the Stone Age people is we didn't have to chisel it into stone tablets, but it was the equivalent. <laughs> but you couldn't even draw a picture. The, the artists did show up who could use ASCII characters to create pe works of art, and and they were very very helpful. And and in those days, back in those days, I met people who I have not physically seen in my entire life. And I helped one of them adopt a child in Russia. I'm not Russian. I don't speak right. I was I had his back for this because we were able to connect through these ASCII characters in a way that a lot of people I know can't do if they are in the same room. And it's probably better that they're not in the same room. So you know, the, so what all I'm saying is, well, the possibilities there, but you have to recognize that it could be. And he recognized it. I recognized it. In that sense, we recognized it. And it's fine. And we can derive a lot from this because all of us are here because we all believe, I believe, that there's more than just us. That's why we talk. That's why we actually get together and throw words at each other, hoping some of them stick. Some of them may get stuck the wrong place. Well, move them over to the other way because we can interact in a you know, way to, to help that out. But you have to have that fundamental realization, I believe, that there's something more than just me. You don't, you don't it, have it. it. You're in isn't, trouble. Isn't that 
uh, and Marco did this thing called the loneliest road. Isn't the crux of that loneliness? Well, it, I, I think in one regard it is. Gapser, his name's some banner in the body here. He says, you know, we can integrate, we can become integral, we can disintegrate. That's, that's just the flip side of the coin. Sorry, it's just as big a possibility. And, and loneliness, and that was the whole, really, if you look at a lot of the novels of the 1950s, it was, you know, I, I, I'm nowhere, I'm nothing. The whole nihilism thing comes, uh, you know, tumbling into that because it is very possible to feel that I am so I have no connection to anything or anyone else. And so affording other individuals the opportunity to make that connection, to realize that there is something more than me and that more than me is another. It's an other, simply. That, pure and simple. And if you get to that point, if you realize that, if you have that realization, that experience, then there, I believe you will immediately find some kind of hope. It may be weak and it may be not worth putting on and a lot of it will depend on how that relationship develops, but you have to get, you have to make that initial step to get beyond oneself. And we're told day in and day out that there's nothing beyond ourselves. And, and that's just a, that's a poor message. That's what our whole economic systems build upon. It's all self-interest. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. No, it's not. It's also about that. And yeah, that plays a role in it too. But it's, that's not all it's about. We can't reduce it to that. But, that's, but that is something that we hear. But you have to acknowledge at that point that there's something more than me. And this something more can lead to other mores. And that's, and that's to me, the, the uh, opportunity of these new technologies is that that particular message that there is more than just you can continually be sent out amongst the other signals that it has to compete with, of course. But anyone who drops into one of these cafes is probably in for, you know, they'll either commit suicide before they get to the end of the tape or they'll listen to it to the end. You know, they're going to go, oh, what are these guys doing? You know, how did these four or five people get together and, and do that? It's it's an actually an absolutely amazing phenomenon, if you ask me. Because there's no reason on God's green earth why the right now the four of us should be here talking about what does it mean? What is communication? What does that actually mean to communicate? And what do we think we're doing when we're doing it? It's it's if you step back from it, I'll take just a half a step back, it's mind boggling. But we do this. But we do it. And as sadistic as we all are, we all tend to enjoy it, or as masochistic as we are, depending on how we're looking at it. But we seem to enjoy it because we, we come back and we do it again. Because there's something about doing this that's worthwhile. And, and that is, to me, the important step. It's the tr tree that goes, oh, oh, there's another tree out here. Okay, whatever that means, whatever they talk about, okay, but... I've made connection. I can't, un I can't disconnect. So it may not be with you folks if I lose my internet feed, but I know that with other pe human beings, this is possible. Okay, well, then I'll go off and do it there. I've, I've learned something that I can take with me that's going to be, I believe, of evolutionary value. Hmm. At, at that level, see. But it could also be way up here where, what are we going to do about the next power plant? Yeah. Probably a little wrong in a protesting of the village anyhow. Damn. But next one. If we're up to it. Hmm. That's all you can say is, hmm? That was point, it was, uh, I actually uh, find a very fitting response. It was, no, it was wonderful. It was... Uh, it was it's poignant. It was coherent. It was illuminating. It was um, uh, it was hale. It was hale and whole. Same. <laughs> yes, and humph worthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm. You know, I, I um I had an interesting experience last week, and I'm just going to share it. It may be a non sequitur, but um. 
may have something to, to, to do with be some kind of response. I didn't understand the conversation. Like I, I t- usually we, we talk or with whomever I talk and I feel like I know what's going on uh, or I figure it out and participate and, uh, you know, pl- and play out uh, the the you know what what is um, being discussed, uh, and and I, I see this conversation as a continuation of of last week's, uh, but I was very puzzled. But I was more than puzzled. I was like troubled really? by it, uh, and um, and you know, you've, you've mentioned as well the. Uh, Entanglement. You didn't use that word exactly, but um, I've been looking at a book by Dean Radin, Radin called uh, hum- I forget what it's called, something about entanglement. Yeah. But he, he's taking that phenomena that we associate at the quantum physical level and looking at how it plays out at the consciousness level. So if we communicate, if 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 I read something that of yours or even if it's just ASCII text characters, mm-hmm. uh, um, even more so if, if, if we have a face-to-face encounter, maybe not more so, it depends. But but some there is something really curious that happens, I think, and this is part of the mystery, I think, of, of communication, <clears throat> where um, you can't... Uh, <laughs> You can't um, undo it, right? You said that, like, yep, and, and yep. it initiates a process in yourself that is pre, I would say, pre-subjective in, in the sense that I don't have, I may have conscious influence, I may be able to suppress it, express it, direct it, etc. but it's occurring, and it's occurring within me, but the within me is... Um, it's a it's an organismic space. It's something that I I experience in my body, in you know from the gross lab layers to the sub, most more subtle thought oriented layers. But it's also in a pro, like an, it's in an intersubjective space, and um, it's it's really I think interesting how otherness can become present by virtue of our means of communication, some text characters, and we could feel the presence of another, even across vast distances, across vast periods of time. I mean, that that's kind of the really, really weird part. (laughs) Right. But, But isn't that experience of others subjective and subjective to all your prior beingness knowledge. In other words, you're experiencing another, I don't, if it's, if it's the person in the apartment next door or, or half a world away, all of that is inside of your head and may or may not have any relationship to reality only to you and 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 we've with ta- this technology we've just enhanced that mm-hmm. like i don't know exponentially to the nth degree in in that nobody is certain about anything Yeah, I mean that, that's I think a, pr- a problem. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, issue or a problem? Well, <laughs> I, I, there, it's an issue. But, I mean, what? Just one word I'm going to say is like a false otherness, mm-hmm. where your idea of who somebody else is or what some is not does not actually resonate with how they would experience themselves or communicate themselves. I mean, this is, that's why I say it's a problem because if we're actually in communication, then my representations of you or my, are, 
the way that I communicate about you or what I assume about you when we communicate, you're going to, you, you should resonate with that and vice versa. Right. Like it, it requires that mutuality. It requires this sort of. What do you of, mean by requires? You ever I mean, had sex with somebody who wasn't really into it? Right. Well, well, that's what I'm. Those relationships tend not to last very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen and, again. But they're there. At they that moment in time. Away. Yeah. At that moment, it's sure. They are. But they're in there. They don't go away. They don't go away but, in but, there. But, but, but you're, 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 you're arguing that part of what you know, is happening at this time is that we have a lot of, um, we can have a lot of relationships without them being real. But they are. <laughs> but, but you just said they're not because they're just my ideas. There's, about, the, paradox. About the, other person. There's the paradox. Who, who was it? John Hinckley uh, shot Ronald Reagan so that uh, the girl, the girl escapes my, would, would think he was somebody special. Mm -hmm. But and she probably, she was, Ronald she probably Reagan got but shot. not in the way that he was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but that's the thing. I mean, part of the nature of our mind is that they can go off in directions that are not very connected to uh, all the other minds. Uh, and, and so, I mean, my, what is happening in communication partly is that minds are getting synchronized. Like, yeah, like they sync up with each other. Like when we, Ed and, Ed and John, like they miscommunicate. All right, let's say maybe there's a lot of other things going on here. we but they, th there had to be a back and forth. There had to be a mm -hmm. speaking, reading, interpreting, responding. That had to go through. And that is always the case in any re mm -hmm. relationship where there is actual communication happening. Is There's going to be a sort of process of interpretation and checking, a sort of validation. Do I understand you correctly? And you'll re-articulate in some way. We'll negotiate how we understand what each other are saying or who each other even are, if it gets you know that deep. And we're going to modify our our ways of expression, our, our, our language in order to, um, in order to sustain that connectedness. Because if you can't do that, then th that you will break apart and that will lead to, either just going separate ways or it could lead to violence. It could, you know, the, the, when, when that, when that um, s process of sort of mutual reciprocity, that synchronization, which, you know, it's hard enough with two people one-on-one -on -one, now with a group, now with the society, now with the globe, when that can't occur and um, kind of individual agents break off into their, sometimes that's good because you have an idea that's, you know, more clear, it's better than what's being discussed. You need to break off. But when you become crazy, like psycho, like, psycho, like <laughs> Hinkley or, 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 or if not, or on the opposite, maybe de de depressive, desp despairing, suicidal, because you can't communicate. You don't, you don't have that context of shared mutuality of shared resonance. And that, that's, that seems to be what's really being exacerbated. So my question was, seed question, is this technology helping or hurting that connectedness? That the every short answer is yes and yes. <laughs> that every we all agree on is huh? is is at the root of life. Yeah. Well I I think that you can't look at the technology without looking at the other structures around it because the technology 
is used, it's developed, used, owned, deployed by people, by companies, by you know, particular interests. Uh, I, I, I don't think that, I mean, the, what, what Ed, your experience with the original you know, uh, news groups, right? Mm-hmm. That's a very different kind of experience than a Twitter or, or Facebook or social media experience now, where it's so much easier to use. It's so much more rich. Uh, and But at the same time, it's happening within a... Um, uh, a, a whole a set of economic interests, sometimes political interests, commercial interests, military interests, even that are actually exerting a lot of pressure on how exactly that communication happens. So there's no, it's, there's no um, free and open exchange exactly. I mean, you can be having any kind of conversation, but the context for the conversation in most <coughs> social media spaces is a priori distorted by the economics of the medium. And I mean, that, this is one of the reasons that I want to do Cosmos is to create a space where those distortions are held at bay. They're, the interior of the, the Cosmo, Cosmos media space ideally would be, um, would have a totally different character. And, and but, but the reason for that different character would be because we'd be thinking holistically about the, the, the power structures, the economic structures, the social, the gut, like all the things that are not looked at that are actually obscured by contemporary capitalistic media structures would be reformatted. But there's only, time. there's only 10 of us in the universe who are capable of it. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark, that's 10 more than there were last week. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that is the problem because there are more than 10. But yeah, the, they're, all, more. they're not all coordinating and communicating with each other. So we don't have a, a free, I believe, a free media sphere. But, we there's only, to do, but, but we can only do it in these small uh, groups. We can't, you, we, you, Cosmos Cafe, can't have thousands of people in this discussion. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. They can be, they can be, if it can be replicated, scaled to different places, but it's not going to be this hundred monkey thing. Mm-hmm. Where all of a sudden everybody just whoa, no, no. peace and love and rainbows and unicorns. Yeah, I'm not waiting for that one. <laughs> but that's not even necessary. I mean, I, I I think that what is, if not necessary, at least desirable, is to have a stronger networks of of people that are more or less on the same page and share values, share, you know, certain perspectives on how best to do things or how, how so, better to do things. Wait, is uh, this a stronger network than the corner bar back in the New York, New York in the 1920s? I, I don't know. Is this I a mean, stronger it, network? It, it can be, Boston? I suppose. Like we have the capability of not having Cosmos Cafe this time this time of week we we could literally if we wanted to say we like john for this this is a good example here maybe ed and john like when maybe john misinterpreted the the comment that was made and that that caused john to kind of step away and say well i'm, I'm not liking this communication i'm just not going to participate right now i need to be alone and but at that time if ed happened to be awake they could say well let's just jump on zoom real quick there's 500 links. Let's use this one and let's talk it out real quick. And there's that face to face and you wouldn't have to drive to a corner bar. You don't have to have a drink or you don't even have to really, yeah, you don't have to be in the same location. So that's where the, the maybe global aspect comes in. I don't know, but um, that's one example. 
so there's potential. So we have the potential, but even within our group of 10, we we're going to have communication breakdown. We're going to um, not be optimal, but that could scale. And um, if some, like if our 10 happen to have a communication breakdown, perhaps the other groupings of 10 could come around once they're about like they're out there having similar same conversations and once they come into play maybe they could say hey this is what he meant or there could be a quicker response i don't know but there, there is that potential that's all i want to say yeah well they're different contexts too right i mean because yeah context one is intimate few people talking wherever they're the corner bar the cosmos cafe and we don't need to create massive political change in order for this to be a valuable conversation the other context though is political it means that there's some attempt and this is what i think terry is doing to change or influence the way that people connect and communicate and coordinate and kind of build meaning and uh, act in the wider world. And there are different kinds of communication. I mean, I think that there are pro pros and cons. Um, part of what I was trying to say in the, in the thread is that I think that I prefer the smaller scale <coughs> communication. I would rather write my poem, even if only one other person would read it and get it, than and this may be, I, don't know, I may regret this statement, but then, you know, create some kind of big political change. Uh, I, they're not mutually exclusive. I don't want to presume that. But if I, if, it were, if I had to choose between the, the, the depth dimension of a poetic or literary or just intimate, real, authentic, uh, communication with somebody. And between that and the sort of larger movement oriented, change the world kind of communication, I would choose the former. Uh, and I think that those, there's a tension, you know, between there. And it's, you know, this is an old, this is not new. This has been the tension in, in revolutionary movements you know, since there were revolutionary movements is between the ideological, the kind of political aims of the movement and the particular kinds of expression and communication that are, in men, you know, that are supportive, supportive of, of those aims. And then the, the more, I would say, more radical. And it, maybe they're both radical in different ways, but I'd say the more spiritually radical, the more creatively radical, the more artistically radical, that really, I think, has its origin and home in the intimate, immediate, individual, personal, um, concrete, that doesn't necessarily scale, uh, to, you know, doesn't necessarily support the revolution um, in, 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 in the way that it may be construed uh, by a movement. So um, there, there's the, I, I want to just note that there's a tension there, uh, but I also feel that part of what I'm, clarifying for myself through this conversation through last week's conversation this one the the the, the 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 whole conversation is kind of where i stand on that like where i want to focus what is important where i feel most true uh, and i think that there's this kind of falsification process that happens when you try to to do something political you know, when, when you try to, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of it. I'm wary because I think that it often comes, or, and you can look, see this in the history of art, in the history of literature, those kinds of commitments that people make, that artists make in particular, can often um, really compromise, I think, their art. And, and it's actually, they may think that they're contributing something of value by championing a, a cause, but actually they're undermining the deeper value that they have to give 
through their creative work and um, their more pure creative work. Um, uh, and, and that's very, I know that's problematic. I, I don't want to set up a, a pure an, antinomy uh, between those two domains, but I think that the tension is real. Oh gosh. It's, it's <laughs> Um, well, we're over time. Not that, that matters. Oh, no. Again? What? Again? <laughs> <clears throat> this has been my tension with Terry all along, too. But, I mean, it's probably was expressed a little bit in my opening remarks, um, is, is that, you know, the difference between art and, and politics, uh, and um, I, I don't know that there's I don't have I don't have a re- resolution generally for that. I think in my own case I'm I'm uh, I'm getting some clarity, and and maybe it's just not even my own personal clarity that I'm deciding. It's just that something wants to come through me, and and if I don't find a way to to let it, it will continue to torment me. Uh, and but, <laughs> but you are, you yeah. are. I am. This is a new form of the art of communication. Mm-hmm. I, but there is, there's, what did you say, art, politics, and there's economics. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they're, they're, they're inseparable. There's a Venn diagram, and there's there's very very few who are in the overlap of those spheres. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can figure that out, who's figured that out? Who's figured that out? I can think of like one or two people, and I'm not going to name names. Mm-hmm. Well, until we figure it out, we'll just have to keep trying. As long as the check's in the mail. (laughs) I didn't see anybody sending me a check this week. (laughs) All right. Yeah. Well, uh, um, I'd like to thank so just, all the thousands of people who tuned in. <laughs> you know, we have fans. Yeah. Like, we, 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 we get, we get the occasional YouTube comments. I noticed the YouTube this, channel is now at 100 subscribers. Yeah, 100 subscribers. Really? Damn. Great. Yeah. See? Uh-huh. All right. You go. I, I, can tell, I can share a personal anecdote that uh, even within my own family, they were very surprised at what they found of me on the Internet. <laughs> the other course, side. My immediate question is, what are you, why are you looking? <laughs> if you're afraid of what you're going to find, don't look. <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm learning. I'm coming to embrace uh, our um, underground status. <laughs> I, I kind of I, I think that for maybe you know, uh, for some time, maybe subconsciously or maybe half consciously, I thought that it was, be- it was because of the detriment it was because we weren't doing good enough or we weren't entertaining enough or well, what have you. Um, but, and maybe not there's a, some of that, you know, they're not, not the sex. most polished, uh, you not know, crew. Sex, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come on. Well, you know what I, I mean, what is important to me is that the commun- communication happens, is that the conversation happens. There's something qualitative when uh, it feels that one has heard, been heard, has understood something, 
where maybe some assumption you've had or something you haven't looked at has been disturbed. Like that is something that happens in the process of communication. Like that, whether there are viewers for that or not, the important thing in my book is that it happens. That's the value of, I think, what we're doing. And I mean, to me, that's the value of, uh, of you know, the whole process of writing and reading and even just trying to talk to people is that as hard and difficult as it is, and I don't want to, you know, wrap this bow too, too neatly, uh, but you do get somewhere, actually. You do get a little further than where you started if, if you, I think... I don't know if you can do it well or not, but if there's some faithfulness, let's just say, a fa- I think that word is occurring to me now, a faithfulness to, it's not to each other, it's not to ourselves necessarily, but it's to what, whatever it is that wants to be said. And maybe we, talk, we can talk about that another time, the agency of, of the, 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 the thing itself. Um, um, but... That that faithfulness, that practice, and I hear a bird ch- ch- chirping. It's, it's, it's great, kind of, isn't yes. it? <laughs> yes. No, it's great. Um, I mean, I, I think that whatever happens to the world, if we can't do that, then I don't care what happens to the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, right? Uh, that's to me an abstract possibility if i can't have a if i can't communicate with my family with my friend with my neighbors with you what's the point um and not that i'm the point but if we can't do that then what's all this about so well, if we lose that ability then what are we what, what, what well well we're not we this small group and and maybe others are not i mean part of i think what i what you're saying is showing up is important showing up and 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 playing the game and the game is life and and communication is a huge part of it be it trees i'm still scratching my head over that one Okay. I'll see if I can find you a link. I'll send you. <laughs> <laughs> the trees are communicating. They compete for certainty. They compete. But I don't know if they have, you know, they go, oh, gee, I'm sorry I took your water. I don't know if they're. So, but we're showing up and we're trying. We're making mm-hmm. effort, which is important to me that. You know, you don't run away and hide. Mm-hmm. We're making an effort. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can live with that. Mm-hmm. So can I. All right. Well, uh, to be continued. To be continued. To be continued. <laughs> okay, right. you guys um, have a wonderful holiday weekend. Uh, we holiday. had our what next week. Uh, next week for you guys is Memorial Day. Oh, yeah. You're really tired, oh, Mark. You don't recognize these things anymore, you know. And over there, stores aren't even over here. Everything closes up on holiday. It's like you know. So we had our twenty four seven consumerism. Yeah, I know. There you got go for it. USA. Go for it. <laughs> Well, that means uh, summertime, too. So, uh, yeah. barbecues and... Let's go hiking, Marco. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. All I'm right. not going to freeze. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You guys take care. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Good day. Bye. See ya. Bye.